Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome at Midrand Chapel. The chosen frozen this morning. We've got a, a, a nice, fresh breeze coming through. To lead our hearts uh, this morning, or to warm it up, before we sing our first song, Be Unto Your Name, Psalm 92, verses 1 through 5. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. Let us stand and sing and worship this wonderful Lord. <clears throat> Please be seated. A very warm welcome to everyone, and especially for the first time visitors this morning. I know uh, Tyron is here the first time. Hands up there. Door stewards, we have one here. <laughs> is, is there anybody else? Great. We'd love to connect with you. We'll give you a card, a visitor's card, and then after... The service during tea time, you can hand it in. We'll have a visitor's table and um, we'll give you a visitor's pack so you can know a bit more about us and we more about you. Welcome, Tara. Again, the question, why have we come here this morning to worship our God? It's very simple, to give our almighty so sovereign God, all the glory. Because He gave us His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And we have a communion service this morning. 
This is our focus this morning. He gave us Jesus Christ to die for us. So at the end, He raised from the dead, from the grave, after three days, so that we can come to the Father and be in His presence like we are this morning. We can come to the holiest of holy, not the building, but in our hearts and minds and through the Spirit. For our opening prayer this morning, I'd like to read an old hymn to prepare our hearts as we will pray together this morning and ask God's blessing for our service. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. <clears throat> it was written in the 1700s by Augustus M. Toplady. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal, no, respite, no. Could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress, helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to thy fountain fly, wash me, Saviour, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyelids close in death, when I saw to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let me pray and ask God's blessing for this morning. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for this morning that we can first of all gather here in your name, give you all the praise, all the glory, Humble our hearts, work in our hearts this morning as we come to you because you give us the only true hope of being with you one day for eternity. Lord, I pray that you would bless us as a congregation here together this morning as we sing your praises, that the words we sing we will mean from the heart and not just be lip service. That the scripture we will read and hear will penetrate us like a double-edged sword. That we would hear and understand by the Spirit. Lord, I pray your word being preached truthfully this morning. And that it will come, come out strong and mighty and with authority as you are our true God, only God, that we, we praise and that we give glory. Lord, we have communion service this morning and we are being reminded of what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And may our prayers and our song and our scripture reading prepare our hearts as we come to the cross and being reminded of your great work for us. That we will take sin seriously. That we will hate sin as much as you did. And ha as much as you are hating it now. Because you gave us your son. To die for us. Thank you for this morning Lord. And bless our service in Jesus name. Amen. <coughs> A few announcements um, I'd like to share with you this morning. Um, as most of you know, all of us know, COVID is still out there and we are under the regulations um, of um, these new regulations, COVID regulations, still masks to wear and our social distancing. So we here at Midrand Chapel still adhere to that. Uh, visitors information hours change to 10.30 a.m. So it's after tea time. Am I right, Frank? 
Um, yes, I'm right. Okay, great. It's not five past ten anymore, so you, you don't just grab a cup. You can now grab a cup and some cookies. So um, go to the visitors' information time. Then Sunday seminary is 10.30, uh, 10.30 to 11.30. It's after tea time. And uh, we have two teaching venues, one here and one in the minor hall. The minor hall um, is what is a healthy church. And here in the main hall, uh, foundational doctrines and spiritual disciplines. So you have a choice there, especially for the um, new members and people who want to know what a healthy church is. The minor hall um, is on the other side of the kitchen. Sunday school is during Sunday seminary. At 10.30 to 11.30 for children between the ages of 4 and 12 years old. Then a reminder, a very important reminder, 5 p.m. Today we have our prayer meeting. And Chris is praying for a great revival. So let's um, be obedient. <laughs> um, so if you sometimes feel sick before you need to go to a prayer meeting or you've got all these different excuses, so exactly that's the reason to go to the prayer meeting, to pray for that illness so God will help you and heal you. So I encourage you to join us. It's always very hard in the beginning to go. You don't feel like it. You feel tired and all different excuses. But afterward, what a blessing to pray together and um, worship God in that way. Then a very sad <coughs> announcement. <coughs> Memorial service for Cynthia de Villiers who passed away 1st of June. Um, the memorial service will be on the 8th of June, 10 a.m. So we ask um, um, a few people to help. Madrid Chapel is doing the catering. So if you are able to bring a plate of eat or help in any way to serve, set up or clean up, please contact Shirley. All right, I got through that. <laughs> then there's a mommy's growth group. Um, uh, see, the, uh, the one date was uh, this past Saturday. But there are the uh, next few dates coming up. 5th of August, 2nd of September, 4th of November. Marika Grobler um, is presenting and teaching um, in this. A mommy's growth group. Uh, she's an elder's wife from the Afrikaans church. So it's here at Midrand Chapel. I think most of you um, young moms uh, know this. And then uh, just a note on our tithes and offering. We don't take it at up in bags because of the COVID regulations. We um, have a box in the foyer at the entrance. So after, after the service, you can um, hand in uh, your offering there or by EFT. Um, uh, and EFT that into uh, the church's bank account. Yeah, that's the announcements for this morning. And then uh, we have next up our corporate scripture reading. And if I can call up Evans to come and read God's word to us, he will be reading Matthew 7, verses 1 through 11. Thank you, Evans. Is Mike is still on mute? <coughs> um, Matthew 7 verses 1 to 11, and it reads, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. 
first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they tremble them underfoot and turn, and, and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you, and you will seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for him for, for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Evans. We are entering a time of communion, and to lead us, <clears throat> we will sing all I, all I once held dear, knowing Jesus, to prepare our hearts as we are entering this time of communion. So please stand. And let us sing together, all I once held dear, knowing Jesus. be seated. What is communion about? Another beautiful hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross, explains it so well. 
when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See, from His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Yet Midrand Chapel, we serve communion together in a an open communion table for all believers, including children, who confess that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and have a personal relationship with Him. Although we recommend that only baptized believers, including the children, partake, and though we leave that to their own consciences, so we recommend parents to give permission to their children only when they are baptized. But God gives us a great warning in His Scripture in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 through 29. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person then examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And the scripture goes on, and, and uh, Paul here tells the Corinthians that this is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly this morning, we would not be judged. <coughs> So please take this time to examine your hearts, confess your sin. Before we pray and as uh, we prepare for the bread and the cup, you can get your cups and your bread ready. I will pray now and after scripture reading, we will partake together. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this great love of yours that we are still learning day by day who you are and understanding what you have done for us. And as we come to your table of remembrance of what you have done for us, dying on the cross, where your blood flowed freely, willingly, sacrificially, so we can come to the Father where you have broken your body for us, where you have endured un, uh, pain that we cannot understand, that we cannot fathom. And by this showing us how much you love us and your Father showing a great, greater love by giving you his only Son to us, as a sacrifice so we can come to the Father. We are eternally grateful. Help us to live in this manner. Help us to come to this table with a humble heart, Lord, because we cannot boast. It's all you, all your work, because you are sinless and we are sinners. Lord, soften our hearts this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. <clears throat> Before we take the bread, 
1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 24, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. First Corinthians eleven twenty five through twenty six reads In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake together. Let's spend a moment and be quiet in front of the Lord. Amen. Our next song, I will glory in my Redeemer. We can meditate on these words as we have just partaken together at the Lord's Supper. So please stand. I will glory in my Redeemer.
Please be seated. We're entering a time of corporate prayer and a, another beautiful hymn from the old Baptist hymnal to lead us in prayer this morning. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed. The motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Prayer is the burden of a sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye when none but God is near. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. Prayer suppl supplements strains that reach the majesty on high. Prayer is the contrite sinner's voice returning from his ways while angels in their songs rejoice and cry, Behold, he prays. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air, his watchword at the gates of death. He enters heaven with prayer. No prayer is made on earth alone. The Holy Spirit pleads. And Jesus on the eternal throne for sinners intercedes. O thou by whom we come to God, the life, the truth, the way, the path of prayer thyself has trod. Lord, teach us how to pray. And he does. He gives us his word. And we can pray the Lord's prayer this morning. Matthew 6, verse 9 through 13. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our, da our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Enter with me in the time of prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we pray this morning for Mike, Sarah, and Ethan, as Cynthia has gone to be with the Lord. Lord, we pray this morning, Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14, for Mike. And so, from the day we heard, we, we have not ceased to pray for you. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So, as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing to Him. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might. For all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, 
the forgiveness of sins. I pray also this morning for Ethan and Sarah that you, Lord, our great comforter, will comfort them in this sad and heartbroken time that you would pour your love over them, that they will see your beauty, that they'll see your sovereignty, your perfect timing, and that you are God, that you are the loving God in all things, that you are good, that you are always good, and that your steadfast love endures forever. Lord, I pray your comfort over them. I pray your strength to them. That your Holy Spirit will be with them in this time. That they will keep their eyes fixed upon you, upon the cross. On your wonderful work that you have done for them. I pray that Mike will be strong in your word and lead his children. That the unity of the family will stand strong. And that Ethan and Sarah would know you more. And more. Through this calamity. And then from that prayer we prayed. And come to a joyous prayer where we thank new life and praise God for new life. We pray for Nanti and Kerry that you would also, through their pregnancy, keep them healthy, strong, and that they would cling to your cross and know that you are their Lord and that you have knit their little babies in their womb together and they are in his hands. We pray <coughs> for the Colfontaine Outreach, Lord. We pray for Frank and Vishal, who's leading those, the team. We pray for the volunteers. We pray for gospel opportunities as they share and teach and have personal relationships with these students. We, we also pray that you would prepare their hearts and that you would give this team, the Carlfontaine Outreach team, more opportunities. And that they, their hearts would be prepared to share the good news in Carlfontaine. Lord, we celebrate birthdays here at Midrand Chapel with our members. And we thank you for them that we can celebrate together. We pray for Shadrick, Judith, Cipral, Andy. Reuben, Deborah, and Graham. We pray numbers 6, 24 through 26. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And Lord, we then give you thanks for your provision that we can give back what you've given us. Help us to give this joyously with a glad heart, but yet sacrificially, knowing this goes to your kingdom and trusting you in that. I pray for the leaders in our church that they would use your provisions wisely and first, of, first and foremost to enhance and grow your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, I bring all these prayers only through what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And I can only bring them to your throne this morning through his powerful name. Amen. Child care can be dismissed. So the children between two years and grade one may leave the hall as we sing our last song. It is well with my soul. So please stand and let us sing and praise our Lord.
Wonderful to have an opportunity to share God's Word with you this morning. And uh, after such a wonderful worship service, singing a song, it is well with an actual trumpet. The trump actually resounding as we sing is great. Well, this morning I'll be in the book of Judges, so you can turn there so long. <clears throat> And I think at the moment, uh, it goes with, without saying that many of us here at the chapel have had some uh, miserable circumstances in our lives or even to deal with in just the last while. Even now, we as a church are in the midst of tragedy. And in our miserable times, we always need some source of deliverance. And until someone delivers us from the cause of our misery, we will continue in it. And so it's of the utmost importance that we turn to the right source, the right source of comfort, the right leader to lead us out of misery. And as we'll see today, and we look into the story of book, 
in the book of Judges, we'll see why that is. The book of Judges itself is quite a, a frustrating read. If you've ever read it cover to cover, it's a book which covers quite a miserable time in the history of the Israelites. And if you go to Judges chapter 2, you'll see the tone set for the whole book. Judges chapter 2 and verse 1. Israel has failed to drive out the enemies from the promised land as God had commanded them to do. And here's what happens in Judges 2 verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides. Their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. During this time in the book of Judges, Israel is a weeping nation. There is this cycle that repeats in the book of Judges why it is uh, so frustrating of the people of Israel being enslaved, then repenting and turning to God and then God raising up a judge to defeat those enemies only for the people to turn from God again. That happens over and over. The whole book, really, of Judges is a downward spiral. It starts with a couple of good judges, then one that's good and bad, and then it just gets bad and bad until the book ends with a priest cutting up his concubine into pieces and sending her to different parts of Israel. And in summary, the author of the book of Judges, right at the end, and it's an oft-repeated uh, refrain in the book of Judges, but if you go to Judges 21, verse 25, the last verse of the book, the author tells us this. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It was a miserable time for Israel because they were doing what was right in their own eyes. They needed a king who would put an end to the causes of their misery, a king who would prevent them from doing what was right in their own eyes. And so today we'll look at just one of those cycles that happens throughout the book of Judges. Starting in chapter 10, we'll look at the story of the judge named Jephthah. The cycle begins, the Jephthah cycle, if we can call it that, in chapter 10 and verse 6 of Judges. The people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites, and they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years, they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. On this occasion, in the cycle, it is the people of Gilead. They're from the half-tribe of Manasseh who are bearing the brunt of the enemy's oppression. And their primary enemy is the Ammonites. And as they do in Judges, the people, now in bitter distress, cry out to God and repent, turning to him to ask for deliverance. And we won't read it all here, but in answer, God demonstrates to them their foolishness in serving gods who can do nothing for them. He has been faithful to them throughout history, and once again, they've turned away. But again, they repent. And then the author gives us this insight into God's mind during this time in Israel's history. Look at this. This is so important. Chapter 10, verse 16. After they beg God to deliver them, 
God said, uh, the author notes to us, so they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. He became impatient over the misery of Israel. The people have repented. It's time for a change. God does not want their misery to last forever. And in the context of Judges, it's especially significant. Israel was generally miserable during this time, currently going through 18 years of oppression by the enemies. God does not will for that to last for Israel. And so, how the story of Jephthah begins to unfold then is in verse 17 and 18 with the leaders having asked for deliverance, now looking for someone to deliver them. Then the Ammonites were called to arms, and they encamped in Gilead. And the people of Israel came together, and they encamped at Mizpah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said one to another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Leading up to this point in Judges, there has been a struggle for power over Israel. Gideon was sort of the first judge with some good and some bad, and his son, Abimelech, one of his 70 sons, decided he wanted to be in charge and killed all of his brothers and took uh, the throne, as it were, though there was no throne yet. But his reign didn't last long, and he was killed, but his legacy of seeking power over Israel continued. So the elders of Gilead here know that whoever delivers them from the Ammonites will be their leader. They know there is this vying for power. And so throughout this story, we'll see how that plays into things. They know they're not just looking for someone to fight the Ammonites, but for someone to lead them. And so throughout the story, we'll see how these people, the people of Israel, Gilead in particular, choose a leader to try to end their misery, how it is indeed acknowledged that God is the only one who can defeat the enemies, the Ammonites, but then we'll see how the people's chosen leader fails and perpetuates their misery and how the people themselves perpetuate their misery as well in this tragic story. So first, we see the leader chosen by the people, and it is, of course, Jephthah, and we are introduced to him in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 11. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. So Jephthah is a, a great warrior, but he also has a bit of an inappropriate background. He is the son of a prostitute who's been chased out of town by his brothers before becoming the leader of a band of worthless fellows or ne'er-do-wells. Maybe a Robin Hood-esque kind of crew of people, though I don't think they were stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. This is the man that the Gileadites seek out to lead them against the Ammonites. It seems that they've chosen him because he is a great warrior and not for much else. It's certainly not because of the company he keeps, and as we shall see, he should have been vetted further by the elders of the Gileadites. So the elders go to bring Jephthah back home in those next verses. They offer him headship over Israel if he is able to defeat the Ammonites. And look at his response in 11 verse 9. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And we see a glimpse into the kind of person Jephthah is there. He has a belief in God. He knows that if the Ammonites are defeated, it really won't be by his hand but by God's. And yet, he has personal ambition mixed up in there. 
He wants to become the head of the Gileadites. Perhaps he too is interested in ruling over Israel as Abimelech was, as those who came before him. So we see Jephthah is a complex character. He's not just all good or all bad. He has faith in God. Indeed, he is mentioned even in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith. But he does not keep good company, and he has an ambition for power. This, then, is the leader chosen by the people to deliver them from their misery. And I think we all know it's not going to work. It takes more than a great warrior to save God's people. It takes someone after God's own heart. And so the story continues. We see that Jephthah acknowledges that misery is to be defeated by God in his, reply, in his messages that he sends now to the king of the Ammonites who he needs to drive away. He begins attempting to get them to stand down. The king of the Ammonites apparently here has some sort of uh, land claim. He believes he has the right to some of the land that the Gileadites in particular are living in on the eastern side of the Jordan, um, for those of you who have looked at some maps in the back of your Bible. He believes that he is entitled to the land of Gilead and eastern Manasseh and demands that Jephthah return it because Israel took that land when they came out of Egypt. He took it from the Ammonites and the Moabites. Jephthah replies to this by accurately explaining what actually happened during the time in question. And here's what actually was happening. Israel was seeking passage to the land of Canaan. They were trying to get through this land and that land and the other. And none of the kings would let them through, mostly because they were afraid. And they came to this one king, the king of Sihon, who rather than just denying them entry, also decided that he would take them out. And he went after them, but he lost. And it was his land that the Israelites actually took. The land in question is that land. And so, Jephthah replies in chapter 11, verse 21, to all of this, having accurately recounted this, and this is found in the book of Numbers recorded by Moses. He says in verse 21 of chapter 11, And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. And then in verse 23, So then the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and are you to take possession of them. He again demonstrates his faith in God. He goes on. Look at 20, verse 24. Look what he does. This is in a letter he's written to the king of the Ammonites. He says, Will you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess? Now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever contend against Israel, or did he ever go to war with them? While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages, and in Aruor and its villages, and in all the cities that are on the banks of the Arnon, that's the land in question, 300 years, why did you not deliver them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. So the king of the Ammonites, Jephthah is saying, actually does not have a dispute with him, but a dispute with God. For it is he who has given this land to the Israelites, who has given this victory to the Israelites. And so Jephthah here is demonstrating an impressive knowledge of the Scriptures, as recorded by Moses in Numbers, and faith in the one true God. He knows the history, and he has quite correctly attributed all the victories to God. And he pits the God of the Ammonites, Chemosh, up against his own confidently and warns them by mentioning Balak. Do you know who Balak was? Balak was that king of Moab who asked Balaam, Balaam and his talking donkey, to come and curse Israel. Could Balaam do that? No, he couldn't even curse Israel because he had to obey God and he blessed them over and over again. 
to the point where Balak just up and left. As Jephthah says, he never even went to the battlefield with Israel. And Jephthah says, are you guys any better? Are you going to dare to fight against us when that king of Moab couldn't even come against us and curse us because God was on our side? He knows that if the Ammonites come against him, they will be defeated because when, God's lead, when God leads his people, they do not lose. But the, Ammonite, the king of the Ammonites won't listen to reason. He chooses to ignore Jephthah and Jephthah's God. And they will indeed be defeated for that. For God is impatient of Israel's misery at the hand of the Ammonites. And when the time comes for Jephthah to go out and defeat the Ammonites, the Spirit of the Lord comes on him in verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed on to Mizpah and Gilead of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And he does indeed go and subdue the Ammonites as he was confident that he would. And if the story of Jephthah ended there, it would have been great. What could we have learned? We would have learned here is a faithful man of God, rich in knowledge of his word, called to defeat the enemies. He has full confidence in God. He does, in fact, defeat them and ends Israel's misery. Oh, what lessons we can learn of having confidence in God and serving him. We can learn that God is faithful and blesses our faithfulness. But apparently that is not what we are to learn from this story because it does not end here. And like the rest of the book of Judges, things are about to spiral out of control in Jephthah's life. So let's go and see how Jephthah, the people's chosen leader, perpetuates the misery of Israel in verses 30 to 40. Everything changes in a single verse here. This man, filled with scripture knowledge and confidence in his God, on whom the Spirit of the Lord has come, does something unthinkable. He makes a vow to God to do a human sacrifice. 11 verse 30. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give me the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. You may see the footnotes there that whatever comes out can be translated whoever, and that I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering can be translated as him. What in the world is he thinking? He's not saying whatever comes out of my barn door or my stable door, but out of the door of his house. He knows it's going to be a person that comes out. Besides the absurdity of making a vow like this, why even make a vow at all? Jephthah's shown he's confident in God. He's demonstrated it clearly. The Spirit of the Lord has come upon him. Victory will be a certainty. Perhaps Jephthah's background explains this to us. Perhaps this group of worthless fellows that he was exiled with practiced human sacrifice. Perhaps his mother, who was a prostitute, was also a Canaanite caught up in pagan practice. We don't know. But we are in Judges. Things spiral out of control. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And this seemed right to Jephthah to make this vow. Indeed, the elders of Gilead failed in choosing a leader. They failed to properly vet whether Jephthah was into human sacrifice or not. But of course, and the Spirit of the Lord even on him, but of course the Spirit of the Lord coming upon you does not make you perfect. It ensures your success in spite of your imperfections. That is true even for us today. We have the Spirit. We still sin, but we're still on the way to glory. And so tragedy strikes when Jephthah returns home victorious because it's not just any person that comes out to meet him. It's his only child, his daughter. Look at verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. 
She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months, that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said, Go. Then he sent her away for two months. She departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. <clears throat> and at the end of the two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. Suddenly, this doesn't feel like a victory anymore, does it? It doesn't feel like Israel have defeated their enemies. We may think, how is it that Jephthah would do this thing? But the author doesn't tell us what he should have done, just tells us what happened. And I think, just to, on a side note here, that many of us may have heard arguments that Jephthah never actually planned to do a human sacrifice when he made his vow. But I think that his response to what happens and the lack of any description in the scriptures of a, of a virgin being sent to serve at the tabernacle, that they have to remain a virgin forever, and so that's actually what Jephthah's daughter was mourning. That's just not in the, in the Bible anywhere that that kind of thing happens. And along with where we are in the book of Judges and how things, this is after Gideon and things are spiraling out of control, Samson is next and he's all over the place and then we have that story about the priest I mentioned earlier. So it does seem indeed that he, def that he actually sacrificed his daughter as a burnt offering. And there's this, that question though, how can he end up in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 if he did that? Well, King David's in the Hall of Faith, and he had a man killed to steal his wife. So apparently you get into the Hall of Faith by grace. So anyway, moving on from that, the author tells us that Jephthah's daughter was a virgin. She had no children, and that she mourned for her virginity. She mourned the fact that she would be fruitless. Indeed, the whole affair, this whole sacrifice and vow was fruitless and tragic a sacrifice which certainly did not please God, that did not bring about any victory for Israel, and yet was done in God's name. And so, rather than Israel's misery being removed by defeating the Ammonites, what is it that happens? A new tradition is started in Israel of mourning. The misery is not gone. A foolish vow, a fruitless sacrifice, tragedy and misery in Israel, even though the enemy outside has been defeated. The real cause of Israel's misery was apparently not the Ammonites. Even with them defeated, there is still death amongst God's people. Jephthah defeated the Ammonites who were killing Israel, but Jephthah kills Israel too. And so we see how this leader perpetuated the misery of God's people. But the story of Jephthah is still not finished. The misery is perpetuated further still, this time by the people of Israel themselves. He has one more conflict to deal with in his short tenure as judge of Israel. Another enemy is called to arms. He must now face an enemy from within Israel itself. Look at ver chapter 12, verse 1. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. 
And, yet, and when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites. And the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim, because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of, J of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? And when he said no, they said to him, Then say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan, and at that time 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. So Jephthah faces Ephraim. And you know who Ephraim is? The half-tribe Ephraim. Who's their other half? It's Manasseh, and that's where Jephthah and the Gileadites are. A fight amongst brothers now within Israel breaks out. The Ephraimites are seeking to partake of the glory that is due God in defeating the Ammonites. And once again, Jephthah reasons with them. I asked you to come. You didn't want to at the time. They don't listen, and they want to fight. The vying for power over Israel has not stopped. Ephraim wants it. They see that Jephthah's beaten the Ammonites and he's now the head and they want that power for themselves. They go so far to start calling each other illegitimate Israelites and so forth and there's this very clever but sad way of rooting out the Ephraimites and killing 42,000 of them. Jephthah has victory again but again it doesn't feel like a victory doesn't feel like a victory because he kills 42,000 of his own brothers. Yet once again, there is no victory for Israel. There's still misery. Jephthah may have won, but it was his fellow Israelites he had to destroy. The author of Judges is showing us something with these two conflicts. If you look back at chapter 10, verse 17, and this is the only two places where this language is used in the book of Judges, is here in the story of Jephthah. He says in 10 verse 17, then the Ammonites were called to arms. And then again in chapter 12 verse 1, then the men of Ephraim were called to arms. He's playing them off against each other, these two conflicts. The cause of the misery of Israel, he is showing them, doesn't lie with their oppressors, but it lies within Israel itself. Do you see that? Victory over external enemies is inconsequential when there is sin within. This sinful vying for power leads to more death for the Israelites. The, and indeed, aren't, isn't that the cause of their misery? It's sin and death. Sin and death. They may turn to God over and over and have temporary victories, but they are not lasting. They choose for themselves leaders in a way that seems right in their own eyes, so their misery is only ever temporary. As long as this continues, they will continue to turn from God and follow the vicious cycle of the book of Judges. As long as they choose flawed leaders in this flawed way, they will follow God in a flawed way and perpetuate their misery. Battles won are not really battles won when you have to fight them over and over and over again. And therein lies the misery of Israel. Therein lies their weeping. For every judge there ever was does something to perpetuate their misery because they in some way lose the battle. They sin and they bring death. Indeed, that is the final thing recorded about Jephthah is his death in verse 7. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. He dies in the end having defeated the Ammonites and becoming the head of Israel. But what a miserable time it was. A time when Israelites killed Israelites fruitlessly. Israel under Jephthah had the same problem that we do. The same root cause of misery, sin and death. 
And we, like the Israelites, do all kinds of things that seem right in our own eyes to deal with it. We choose to follow sinful men into more and more misery. But we live in a time when God has provided a conqueror to sin and death. He has defeated these enemies, these causes of our misery. He's provided a king who we can follow with full confidence. I was worried that might happen. Hey, hey, if it, uh, if it doesn't move you, it won't move the people, right? At the end of the story of Jephthah, God is yet impatient with the misery of his people. But now he has begun the end of it. He has begun the end of the vicious cycle. He has won the battle once and for all. No more will his people slog through leaders and enemies and battles and misery. The story of Jephthah left a gaping hole which God has filled today. God acted on his impatience of his people suffering once and for all when he sent Jesus Christ to earth. God himself appointed Jesus the king rather than the people who don't know what they're doing. And he was chosen not because he was a great warrior, even though that's exactly what the Jews of Jesus' day were looking for. In fact, Jesus is chosen because he is God, which means that everything that is right in his eyes is right. He has no personal ambition as Jephthah had, but rather he's there to serve the will of his Father. Not my will, but your will be done. That's what he said in Gethsemane. Not if God gives me the victory over sin and death, I will lead all the earth and be their head. No, it was the head of the earth already condescending to take care of our enemy, to give us the victory. And this is where that fruitless, tragic hole left by Jephthah is filled by Jesus. His sacrifice was also willed by men because it was right in their eyes. He too, as Jephthah's daughter did, went willingly in spite of the foolishness and evil of the situation. But ultimately, it was the will, will of a foolish father that sacrificed, it wasn't, sorry, the will of a foolish father that sacrificed Jesus, but the will of a loving father in heaven. The sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter was fruitless and changed nothing, but Jesus' sacrifice changes everything. It bears all the fruit that we see anywhere today. The cross is the tree on which the fruit we see sitting here today grows. Jesus' death was the means to victory. Jephthah's daughter's death didn't change anything about the victory. Jesus' death is the means. It was the death blow to the enemy. It wasn't just a, a sacrifice to keep a tragic vow to God, but it was a sacrifice to keep that great promise given in the garden that the serpent's head would be crushed. The death of Jephthah's daughter defeated no enemy. Jesus' death conquers the greatest. <clears throat> and now, as we live as disciples of Jesus saved by grace, our own sin defeated and our own death stingless, we can live with true joy, with the misery beginning to dissipate. Look at John chapter 16. John 16 verse 19, Jesus speaks to his disciples Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish. For joy that a human being has been born into the world, so also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. 
truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will, re will receive that your joy may be full. The twelve knew that, well, well, we know now what Jesus was talking about. He was going to the cross, but he was going to rise again. And as their sorrow is turned to joy at the resurrection. Our joy can be the same, a joy which no one can take away, a joy which will in fact be added to until it is complete. And somehow, well, see that, see that contrast that Jephthah perpetuated misery, but Jesus defeats it and secures perpetual joy. Somehow, even in our sufferings, our own battles, even ones that we're facing right now, they may cause misery, but they're not fruitless anymore. We can even count them as joy. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So why is it then that we still have battles that cause misery? Well, it's to bear fruit now. It's not fruitless like those battles with the Ammonites and the Ephraimites. These battles will never bring us into utter misery because they're not fruitless. Rather, they produce a steadfastness which will sanctify us and make us complete, ready to spend an eternity of joy with God and our one true appointed King, Jesus Christ. The cycle of the book of Judges finally broken. So what can we make of all this today? How should it transform us? Well, I hope that you see that we need to be pointing ourselves and others to one king and one king only. If we choose men to free us from our misery, we'll be bitterly disappointed. If you expect your pastor to free you from your misery, you're looking in a woefully insufficient place. No offense, Chris isn't here. He's looking after the children, I believe. If you're looking to the government to take away your misery, if you'll be a wretch yet, if you're looking to your parents to free you from depression, expect your depression to increase. Go to Christ. He will free you. He will give you a certain hope that sin and death will only hold you for a little while more before you go to misery-free heaven. But know this, a warning if you do not turn to Christ, your misery will not end with death, it will only begin. And then to those of us here who are leaders in any capacity, parents, pastors, elders, teachers, wherever you are, you need to be pointing the people away from yourself and towards Christ. You are yet doing things which seem right in your eyes but are not in God's. And you don't have to be a perfect leader. You don't have to be Jesus. We have a Jesus. So point everyone to them. Parents, know that you cannot end your child's misery, but Christ can. Send them to him. Leaders here at the chapel, Bible study leaders, Sunday school teachers, point those in your care to Christ. You will only perpetuate their misery if you point them to yourself. Indeed, every one of us can point this miserable world to the faithful king. He has not saved us. He has saved us from sin and death and misery to eternal joy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this story of Jephthah. We thank you, Lord, for what it teaches us. It teaches us that looking for a leader here on earth to end our misery will only make it worse. It shows us who our true enemies are, and it shows us who our true Savior is. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Jesus, that you came to die for us, to end our misery and complete our joy. 
And so, Lord, we pray that we would be a people here at the chapel who are always turning to you and always pointing others to you in all things. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. We don't have a closing hymn, but we do have a benediction from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.